Hello, I'm Dr. Adam J. Bach. We're going to continue the conversation with more details about customers to follow up on our prior conversation about opportunities. So in our prior conversation, we talked about the concept of opportunity attractiveness, and I'll review that in just a moment. And then today, we're going to focus very specifically on more details about what makes customers and customer segments attractive. So to talk about opportunity attractiveness, we used a framework called the New Business Road Test. And this goes on the understanding that not all opportunities are equally attractive. Some are just fundamentally more attractive than others. In other words, they have more potential to result in a successful venture. And in the New Business Road Test framework, we look at it from a couple of perspectives, a micro level and the macro level. So the micro level is sort of the very specific ground level. The macro level is way up at the top, the high level. And we can think about it from the market and from the industry perspective. And we covered those uh, in our last conversation. Uh, what we're trying to do is to think specifically about the external factors that determine whether this is an interesting or attractive opportunity. Now, there's lots of internal factors we could consider as well. Things associated specifically with the team, aspirations, mission, capabilities, and then do we have a network and connections around the value chain? Now, if you're going to be assessing your own venture, or even perhaps in second semester as you're working with the uh, CDL venture that you get paired up with, those could be interesting things to consider. And I'd encourage you to maybe uh, purchase a copy of the New Business Road Test, it's not very expensive, uh, to learn more about that. But our primary focus is on the nature of the opportunity itself, and that functions without those internal elements. So the first question we want to answer then is, as uh, it says in chapter two of the new business road test, will the fish bite or do customers matter, right? And this is maybe the single most important lesson you're going to get in this program uh, or even in any entrepreneurship course generally. It's not about you, right? Uh, and it isn't about your amazing technology and the cool products and services that you've generated. Those are all nice things. We're, you know, we're thrilled that you have those. But ultimately, a successful entrepreneurial venture is determined by whether or not you are serving a customer need or addressing a customer pain. You could have the coolest technology on earth, but if it does not solve a problem, then it is very unlikely that your venture is going to be successful. So the New Business Road Test then poses a series of micro-level questions. So we're down at sort of the ground level here. We're talking about customers and segments. And those questions are, is there a target segment where you can offer the customer a, com a clear and compelling benefit or resolve their pain at a price that they're willing to pay? Are these benefits in the customer's minds different from, or and in particular, superior to whatever is available now? Now, notice that phrasing, in the customer's mind right? Because you might think that your technology is 10 times better than what's already out there, but that doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is whether your customers believe that or not. Uh, and if they don't believe it, then it flat out doesn't matter what you think or even if it's true. Uh, all of this has to exist in the minds of the customer. So how large is this segment and how fast is it growing? And this is kind of a reflection of what we talk about at the macro level, right? Where we're talking about how big the market really is. Uh, because segments that are big and growing are more attractive than segments that are small and shrinking. And then finally, does entry into this market give us access to this segment? Does that give us access to other segments going forwards? So we want to then think about what makes customers and segments attractive. And we touched on this in our last conversation, but I think it's important to reiterate and make this very explicit. First, they should be easy to find and easy to access. Uh, that is, you can figure out who they are, where they are, and you can figure out the entry point in order to be able to talk to them. Uh, there are many types of customers and many segments that are very difficult to find. The second is they have money to spend. We are not talking here about things like social good, uh, social entrepreneurship, or how right a given uh, uh, sort of a you know generic sense right how a given opportunity is. What we're saying is that when customer segments have money to spend, they are fundamentally more attractive from a business perspective than customers and segments that just don't have money to spend. We like when customers can make a purchase decision quickly, and there are many sectors and types of customers that don't. It takes them months 
or years in order to make a decision. Uh, and that's fine, but it's not attractive to us as a startup company. The purchasing process at the customer is transparent and accessible. That is, we can enter into that process and we can see and understand how they're going to make decisions. There are many types of customers and sectors where that's a black box and you will have no insight into what's going on. Or worse, the knowledgeable people inside the organization and the end users, the ones who get the benefits, they're not the ones making the decision. That's going to make your sales process extremely difficult. And then obviously, just to reiterate, they have a significant unmet need or a pain point that, th that they would like addressed. But what do investors think about all of this? First, it's important to recognize that while investors like to see big markets, and we'll, we talked about that previously and we'll mention it again in the next uh, quick talk, um, what investors really want to know, especially at the beginning, is who are your first customers going to be? And they're not looking for generic statements like the auto industry. They are looking for the names of specific companies and if possible, the names of the specific individuals who will be making those purchasing decisions. That's what they wanna know because otherwise it means you're not there yet, right? You don't even understand your target segment if you don't know who's making those initial purchases. So when you get in front of venture capitalists and professional investors of any, uh, any sort, you should expect to have them say, I would like the names, maybe the phone numbers or email addresses or websites of the specific individuals who are going to represent your first customers. And investors are also going to want data. Uh, what they really want to see is interest from customers. They want to know that customers are already engaged with what your product or service could provide to them and they're responsive to that, right? So of course, the absolute best thing would be purchases. If you can show purchases, clearly there's a need. Um, the next best thing is situations in which you've been able to put something in front of a customer and they're ready to pay for it. They, you either just can't sell it to them yet or there's some other impediment that can be overcome. Um, but they've, they've basically made some sort of indication of, uh, of purchasing interest. And then the next best thing after that is you've put something in front of customers and they say, yeah, sort of. I, I don't want to buy that, but I would buy something very similar to it, especially if you know that that's something that you can provide. Uh, so when you are getting ready to talk to investors, this is the kind of data that you want to show them. And it could be quotes or an actual recording of a video. Uh, it could be an actual testimonial. It could be a reference. Uh, there's nothing quite so powerful as to hand a VC uh, the name and phone number of someone they can call at a potential customer and you're confident that that customer is going to say, yep, as soon as this is out, I'm buying it first thing, right? Uh, so this is what they're looking for, data, not just sort of blanket statements. As we think about segmenting markets, there's often a standard understanding that we're going to do that based on certain types of characteristics. And entrepreneurs and startup companies are hindered in the market segmentation process by a lack of resources, time, and knowledge. So I want to sort of simplify a little bit of this for you to make sure that you're really thinking about this in an effective way. Traditionally, we create customer segments around things like age or gender in the context of companies, we might look at where the company is located or how old it is or the sector it's in. We might look at things like psychographic factors, like personality attributes or lifestyles. Many of these things can be effective segmentation elements. But the truth of the matter is all we really want to know is how customers behave. What have they purchased in the past? What are their expectations for purchasing in the future? How do they actually interact with the given type of product or service that you want to provide to them? Because that behavior is really what matters, right? Because ultimately, we don't really care what their income or ethnicity or their motives are. We don't really care where they live. We don't really care what they do. What we want to know is when we put this thing in front of them, what behavior will they demonstrate? Will they buy it or will they not buy it? And those behavioral factors, if we can identify them, are the greatest indicator of what's really likely to happen. It's one of the reasons we love to put prototypes 
in front of potential customers because then we get to see the behavior as it really happens. We don't have to rely on what they say. We don't have to rely on third party data. We can find out directly the way they're likely to behave. And that's going to be very, very compelling both for us and for potential investors. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause this and I'm going to basically paste in a short video about Matt Yonkel, who's a UW-Madison graduate who started a, a venture called TurboTap. And he's going to spend about a few minutes just walking through the story. It's an old video. I'm sorry, I know, blah, blah, blah. But it's really interesting to kind of hear where they thought their first segment was and where their segment ended up actually being. This is sort of the process of identifying a beachhead market. That is the market that you think is where you really have the best opportunity to start or wherever you actually end up really starting. If your beachhead market fails, it probably means you don't really understand how customers get value from your product or service. And that pretty much was the case with Matt, as he's going to explain. So please do listen in. Uh, it won't take very long. It's a great UW-Madison startup story, and TurboTap was already uh, acquired, so it's a great success, uh, and Matt's gone on to do other things. My big idea was for a better, faster beer tap. I called it Turbo Tap, and it pours a perfect pint of beer in about two seconds, which is about three to four times faster than a regular beer tap. Inspiration for Turbo Tap came in the form of the Wisconsin Union Terrace. The beer lines there over the summer can be very, very long and very, very slow. And while waiting for a beer in that one of those long and slow lines, uh, I started to think of ways that move the line faster. So being an engineering student, being just generally curious, led me to start to try to think of ways to make the beer go faster. At the same time, there was also the Schuess Prize for Creativity, which was in its second year. And having that $10,000 prize hanging out there certainly provided additional incentive for me to go out and try to solve this problem. The, the process of moving from concept to reality is never a straight line. You're zigzagging all over the place. The entire process involved hiring people, raising money, uh, marketing, public relations. It's, it's just the whole gamut to create a, a business now, not just a product, but a business around a, a concept. Everyone asked me, so you're able to make, make a living making beer tabs? Said, yes, I've been able to make a very good living uh, making beer tabs. So financially, it's been great. But I think just the freedom that comes from charting your own territory and, and and starting your own business is, is phenomenal. You're able to build an organization how you like it built and involve the people that you want to involve. The lifestyle that comes from charting your own path is, is just uh, is extraordinary. My number one piece of advice is that no one has more passion for your own ideas than you. Uh, so if you've got the drive, if you've got the passion, go and do it yourself. Uh, don't look to hand something off or put something on the back burner. If it's your idea and you feel great about it and you've got the skills to go out there and, and make things happen, go and make it happen. thing we want to think about is in terms of getting from one segment to another. Um, and Jeffrey Moore in his books uh, about crossing the chasm uh, and the whirlwind talk about the concept of a bowling alley. This idea that there are market segments out there and your job is to line them up in exactly the right way. And if you do, then when you launch, your bowling ball will take that first market segment down and that will propel everything forward to the other market segments. So it's not as simple as just picking the biggest market segment or even necessarily the most attractive market segment. Those are good starting points. But what you really want to think about is, will I learn things from this first market segment that will give me advantages in going to other market segments? What are the other market segments? What do they look like? Uh, and how closely related are they to this first segment that we're going after? And will we develop necessary capabilities in going after this first market segment? that will make it easier to go after the following ones. 
And if you can approach it in this way, not, not every venture has the resources or the time to be able to do this, but if you can approach it in this way, it means that you're really thinking forwards. You're giving yourself a better probability of success. So what's the bottom line? Bottom lines, it's about customers. It's not about you. You really have to confirm that there's a need or a pain to address. It's not enough just to say it or to show it logically. You need to get that information from them directly. You need to be specific. Who are those first five customers, those first 10 customers? That's what a VC is really going to want to hear. And if at all possible, you're going to want to test that prototype in front of that first segment and be able to then think about what the additional segments are that are available to you afterwards. Thanks for listening. Look forward to talking to you about markets.